pediatric urology fellows. We learned so much from her throughout our um, our um, couple of years of uh, fellowship. So thank you for uh, giving us our your time. And today she's going to talk about urolithiasis and the fructal stenosis the nephrology perspective. I will give the microphone to Dr. Harvey. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you about a, a topic that's a special interest of uh, mine. Um, and it's been a really great collaboration with uh, urology, um, working towards uh, when we see these kids uh, doing an appropriate workup at point of entry so that uh, urology manages the stones and uh, we manage the medical workup, uh, but we've been able to save patients uh, time and trips to the hospital by uh, doing that workup uh, regardless of where the patient enters the system. So uh, to oh, advance my, oh, my slides are not advancing. Okay, uh, by way of disclosures, um, we've just received approval for a, an industry funded study for uh, the natural history of pH3 and primary hydroxyurea is a, a particular uh, interest of mine. So uh, we're just about to commence enrollment. So um, why am I giving this talk today? Well, monogenic diseases account for a greater proportion of stones in children and adolescents than they do in adults. And the monogenic forms are typically more severe and associated with renal impairment. So as the self-appointed Lorax of the nephron and somebody whose uh, job is to preserve kidney function, we know that systemic evaluation is required to diagnose the rare stone disorders that may result in long-term renal compromise. And so the objective is to provide a framework for the evaluation of the inherited disorders that can result both in kidney stones and nephrocalcinosis. And there is some overlap between the two that for some of the inherited disorders, you can see either or both in the same patient. Uh, to briefly review some of the clinical features of selective disorders, uh, a, a fly through overview management of the stone forming disorders. Um, and then I wanted to spend a couple of minutes and discuss some exciting new therapy and clinical trials for the primary hydroxyureas. So my approach to stones is to ask three questions. Why is the patient forming those stones? I.e. what are the risk factors for stone formation? How do I manage the existing stones? And that would be uh, medical therapy uh, and surgical therapy. And how do I prevent recurring stone formation and growth of the existing stones? And in broad categories, the risk uh, factors for uh, stone formation are either too much mineral in the urine, and that can be acquired or inherited, too low a urine volume, which is not as easy to remediate as, uh, as you might hope it would be, um, too little inhibitor of stone formation, and that can be an inherited disorder, it can be diet related, um, we're talking about citrate, um, or an anatomical abnormality that causes stasis, and we all know those patients who have uh, some mild degree of hypernephrosis without any obstruction, but are more likely to develop uh, kidney stones because of slow urine flow. So, um, Low urine volume is, uh, as I said, one of the remedial factors, and anybody who's ever made jello will understand how urine volume is critical to lowering the concentration of whatever solute is in the uh, urine, and it really is one of the mainstay treatments uh, for uh, anybody with kidney stones to try and push that fluid in, uh, intake and increase the uh, urine output. So we classify the stone forming disorders into urolithiasis versus nephrocalcinosis. And you can see that urolithiasis is the term that we use for stones found anywhere along the urinary tract. And they can be in the collecting system, in the kidney, they can be uh, in the ureter somewhere, or they can be sitting in the bladder. Versus nephrocalcinosis, which is the term that we use to describe a generalized increase of calcium content in the kidney. And it's most often um, calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate, but we see an awful lot of stuff that's referred to as nephrocalcinosis. That's just some, some non-specific increased epigenicity in the uh, medullary uh, pyramids, probably because ultrasound is so much more sensitive now than it used to be. Um, and so uh, we do a workup and uh, quite often in those children, we don't find anything, but we do know that it's really important to find the kids who present looking like these two pictures, 
uh, because they have a serious underlying uh, disorder, along with uh, this type of picture, uh, that we need to systematically diagnose and treat for preservation of kidney function. Stones can be um, uh, classified based on their composition with uh, calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, the purine stones, which are not so common uh, in North America, cysteine or infection related stones. They can be uh, classified based on their location in the upper tract, whether they're staghorn or uh, discrete stones, whether they're in the ureter or in the bladder. And they can also be classified by their radio density with uh, calcium based stones being radio opaque um, and the uric acid stones uh, being radiolucent and intermediate for cysteine and struvite. But really from a diagnostic and functional uh, point of view, stones are most often classified by their solid phase component. And that's a reflection of the urine milieu at the time of stone formation. And, and that is what we're looking for to see what are the factors that could be modified to reduce stone formation. Um, and the, but far and away in North America, but this will vary uh, based on where you live in the world, the majority of stones are going to be calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. I'm not going to go uh, really in any depth over clinical presentation. You guys know this. It's very highly variable. It depends on the age of the child. It depends on the size of the stone and whether they're uh, passing it or not. Um, but many children will have gross hematuria. Many, uh, uh, almost 100% will have microhematuria uh, during an episode of renal colic. And then there may be associated um, findings related to the underlying cause of the stone, uh, such as uh, infection related stones or uh, symptoms related to obstruction. But we also see a number of children who uh, are more likely going to present with nephrocalcinosis or some of the more severe stone forming diseases where they may just present with failure to thrive in acidosis. And so this is a child with uh, renal tubular acidosis, um, or they may present with renal failure as we see with uh, mostly the primary hyperoxyluria type one. And quite often uh, stones are found as an incidental finding in an asymptomatic patient on an ultrasound done for another reason. So when we start to approach the, the uh, patients, the, the diet history is actually really important. It includes your fluid intake, but it also includes sort of therapeutic diets. And we see a large number of kids um, who get stones or nephrocalcinosis because they're on the ketogenic diet, which is associated with hypercalciuria and hypocitraturia. So, and an elevated calcium to citrate ratio. But you can also see patients, and I, and I saw a child recently who I was convinced had pH three, um, but really had, was on a really high oxalate uh, diet because it's a very healthy diet with lots of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, and just diet modification has brought her uh, oxalate down. Um, and as well, your, your diet influences the pH of the urine, which influences the solubility of a lot of uh, minerals. High sodium intakes associated with hypercalciuria, high doses of vitamin C uh, may give you or contribute to oxalate stones and low calcium intake can be associated with um, absorptive hyperoxyuria. So taking a good dietary history is actually quite important. You know, we work at, uh, I work at the hospital for sick children, I should say, where we see a lot of very complicated patients with underlying diseases where they're treated with medications that predispose them to stone formation. And so glucocorticoids are a big one um, with um, loss of uh, calcium from the bones, which then has to be excreted. There's a couple of anticonvulsants which are well known to uh, cause either hypo, uh, hypocitraturia or hypercalciuria, a combination of the both. Um, we've seen lots of children um, who received uh, tyrosamide um, who develop uh, kidney stones. And ceftriaxone is an antibiotic that is associated with stone formation. If you've been on it for a week or 10 days or so, there is an incidence of uh, stone formation. And these are very soft stones that actually um, tend to, to break up and dissolve quite quickly, but can cause some symptoms. We look for specific disorders that might be associated with increased stone risk. They would be some of your congenital malformations of the urinary tract. There'll be disorders that are associated with um, uh, gut inflammation. So cystic fibrosis, short gut, some of the gift patients 
are at risk for stones. And this is related to increased oxalate absorption. We see a number of kids who develop kidney stones because they're immobile after surgery or prolonged hospitalizations, and that results in calcium loss from the bones and increased calcium excretion. And then a population of patients who are neurologically abnormal, where they're immobile, have a low fluid uh, intake, uh, and are at increased risk for stones. And then family history is important, particularly when you're talking about the inherited disorders of uh, consanguinity, family history of kidney stones, renal failure, dialysis, or transplant, and looking for effective siblings, which would point you in the direction of a, a recessive disorder. And then finally, past medical history of recurrent urinary tract infections that might be associated with uh, struvite type stones, those periods of uh, immobilization uh, that can contribute to urolithiasis or underlying syndromic uh, presentations that uh, can be associated with uh, stone forming disorders like lesh 9 or low syndrome, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, shortly. So the red flags for inherited stone disorders that we're looking for are on history, young age, family history of stone disease, consanguinity, or recurrent stone formation. On physical exam, things like growth delay, de developmental delay, cataracts, deafness, which is associated with some of the renal tubular uh, acidoses, um, bony disorders, um, or ocular disease uh, that can be associated with clodding mutations. The renal imaging showing nephrocalcinosis, increased echogenicity, or uh, bilateral disease or multiple stones. And then on laboratory assessment, impaired um, kidney function, a positive urinary amino acids or uh, nitroprusside test telling us that you've got uh, cysteine stones. Um, and then uh, elevation of certain analytes in the urine, particularly um, oxalate or uh, urate. But we're also looking for evidence of tubular dysfunction because that points us down a different diagnostic uh, algorithm. Um, or acidosis or hypokalemia. And I'll just touch briefly on um, how you use that information. And then probably in terms of the, one of the biggest red flags in stone composition is a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone composition. But you can actually see patients with pH uh, who have, uh, uh, do not have calcium oxalate uh, monohydrate, but they may have calcium uh, dihydrate stones. And then if you have cysteine, dihydroadenine, or uric acid stones, then you're definitely looking for an inherited disorder. So stone analysis, whenever we can capture a stone, um, is really important. We also know that stone composition can change over time. And so it's important to actually send more than one stone to look for changing stone composition, uh, because that may influence your management. Um, when we do imaging, there's multiple purposes of imaging. We want to quantify the stone burden. We want to look for obstruction or stasis as a predisposing factor to stone formation. We want to detect evidence of obstruction as a consequence of the stone. Um, and then we want to determine the likelihood of uh, spontaneous passage. And work that we've done here at Sick Kids has suggested that a stone less than five millimeters is most often uh, passed uh, spontaneously. But a stone greater than seven millimeters is much more likely to require surgical intervention. And that intermediate group, about 50% spontaneous uh, stone passage if the stone is between five and seven millimeters. So you can see that it's important actually to try and prevent stone growth if you've got an underlying predisposition, uh, because that will speak to the ability uh, to spontaneously pass the stone. We also know that stones in the upper or mid pole are more likely to pass spontaneously than those that are in the lower pole. And that does influence our approach. So the goal of imaging really in pediatrics is to avoid excess radiation. So whereas adults will uh, do a lot of CT scans for stone disease, uh, we're gonna mostly focus on ultrasound because it's readily available, it's non-invasive, there's no ionizing radiation, you can do serial studies. And it tells you about anatomy as well as uh, the stone burden. Um, and we can do that longitudinal monitoring uh, quite easily. CT scan has limited use in children, both because of the radiation exposure, but also because smaller poorly calcified stones may be missed on CT. 
and small ureters with little surrounding fat it may be difficult to actually see stones uh, in the ureter. So there is a, um, a percentage of false negative CTs when we're talking about stone disease, particularly in younger children. Um, KUVs have a limited role because uh, some of the inherited stones are uh, not radio opaque, but it has a role for stone uh, localization for uh, lithotripsy, and it may be important in a baseline study in selected cases. And I don't remember the last time we did an IBP looking for uh, stones. IBP has kind of gone the way of the, the dinosaur. Uh, you can get better information from a CT with uh, contrast if you need um, if you need to image the patient that way. So metabolic factors are present for stones in about between 50 and 95% of first time pediatric stone formers. And so that systematic evaluation to say why the patients develop the stone is important. Um, this is a busy table, but basically we're gonna approach it to say, first of all, is your serum calcium elevated? <clears throat> because uh, that's got a, a specific differential diagnosis uh, that might require uh, different management. Are you on medications that are going to cause you to develop uh, kidney stones? Do you have one of these inherited disorders? And then there is a differential diagnosis um, that uh, we have to consider. So the evaluation consists of blood work, urine, stone analysis, uh, and imaging. Specifically for the blood work at a minimum, we want to know that your kidney function is normal, that your serum uh, phos uh, calcium and phosphorus are normal. Magnesium is actually quite important, and I'll show you uh, why shortly. And your screening should include a uric acid um, to make sure that um, we're not dealing with one of the rare inherited uric acid uh, disorders that would uh, change management. We want to measure if uh, pH, uh, typically we're going to do a, a total CO2 uh, rather than a blood gas, and a look at bone health is important as well. And then subsequently, we may do some more studies uh, looking at uh, bone health uh, and looking at specific uh, underlying disorders, depending on where our initial screen leads us. Um, and that may also include specific genetic testing. <clears throat> so uh, urine dipstick analysis is, uh, is cheap. Uh, easily to do at a point of care, but may give us important information. It's going to include things like the urine pH, uh, because that speaks to solubility. It's going to tell us if there's uh, blood or uh, white cells in the urine. Um, and we know that uh, many crystals are going to be less soluble in an acid urine, like cysteine and urate, whereas um, calcium phosphate is more likely to precipitate in an alkaline urine. We're going to do a urine culture. Uh, if, the, uh, if there are leukocytes or nitrites on the uh, dipstick, or if there's a, a history of uh, symptoms that suggest a urinary tract infection. Urine microscopy is really important. Um, and we're uh, working with the lab to try and um, validate some of our uh, samples. Uh, but basically, if you look at the urine, you're looking for specific crystals. And calcium monohydrate, uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals of one of two configurations, they'll either look like these sort of dumbbell type crystals or they may be oval. These are the, the classic calcium oxalate crystals. And we get a number of referrals every year that somebody's done a micro and they've got calcium oxalate crystals. And these are really not diagnostic. Any one of us, if our urine is a bit concentrated, uh, you may see a few calcium oxalate crystals in the urine. So these are uh, more of a red flag than these crystals. Um, uric acid crystals can be um, varying shapes. Uh, and these are your classic coffin lid um, or struvite triple phosphate crystals that you see in kids with recurrent infections. Cysteine stones are always uh, uh, abnormal. If you see cysteine crystals, uh, then um, you can be pretty sure that your patient's got cystinuria. And then the disease that I've never seen in my career, but I live in fear of missing it, um, is a rare inherited disorder that's uh, called APRT deficiency, where you get these unusual uh, crystals in the urine. And it is one of the diseases that causes progressive 
uh, renal impairment uh, due to crystal deposition in the kidney, uh, but with treatment, uh, you can have preservation of uh, kidney function. And occasionally we'll see patients who get crystals in the urine related to medications like uh, acyclovir. Said that stone analysis um, is really very important when we get uh, stones. Um, and it's a, it's a qualitative analysis with either infrared spectroscopy or X-ray diffraction, uh, which is most uh, helpful. And our, uh, our lab tells us what the composition is um, and what the stone is compatible with. So what are the important things to look at in the urine? Um, we're gonna start with minerals. We're gonna look at calcium, oxalate, urate, and cysteine. Um, we're going to look for inhibitors of stone formation, primarily citrate. We're also gonna look in a selected population at magnesium. And our lab is, uh, is pretty good now. We've got them to default that any spot urine uh, they run a creatinine because you need a creatinine in order to interpret a spot urine. But if you're going to practice in a place where that's uh, not a, a reflex uh, lab uh, procedure, then you have to make sure that you order a creatinine because a, a spot calcium in the urine is completely and utterly useless in terms of interpretation because the value relates to the concentration of the urine um, and, uh, and is meaningless in terms of uh, saying whether you've got a risk for stone formation. Hypocitraturia is a major risk factor for urolic biases. And that's because citrate uh, complex is free calcium in the urine and also has a, a direct uh, inhibitory effect on crystal growth and adherence to epithelial cells. And so we see some patients who have a low citrate because they've got a disorder that's giving them systemic acid base. Um, but quite often it's diet related and, and uh, children and adults who have uh, low fruit and vegetable intake uh, may have a low uh, urine citrate. And we can see patients who have a normal calcium in the urine and a normal citrate in the urine, but they have an imbalance between calcium and citrate with an elevated calcium to citrate ratio that puts them at risk for stone formation. So hypercalciuria um, is another uh, common thing and it can be re related to increased intestinal calcium absorption. It can be released uh, related to decreased reabsorption of calcium in the kidney related to medications or underlying disorders. It could be related to uh, immobilization and uh, excretion of excess calcium. And you won't necessarily see an elevated calcium in, in that situation. Um, and as I'll uh, run through briefly, there are inherited disorders that are associated with hypercalciuria. So we're looking not just at the calcium and the citrate, but we're also looking at that ratio. And it's well recognized that in children um, who uh, are stone formers, a ratio of calcium to citrate is uh, of greater than 1.6 uh, con confers an increased risk of stone formation. It's worth saying that when you're interpreting these calcium to creatinine ratios and uric acid to creatinine ratios and so on, that the normal data relates to normal muscle mass and normal creatinine excretion in the urine. And so if you've got a child who's got low muscle mass um, and a, a decreased calcium excretion, or sorry, decreased creatinine excretion, you may get falsely elevated ratios. Um, and so one of the um, things that we can do is a double check on a spot urine, if we're worried about that, is we can actually do a calcium to osmolality ratio. And in patients with low muscle mass, that's better predictive of um, hypercalciuria, but doesn't work so well in patients with a normal muscle mass. Whenever possible, we prefer a uh, prefer time urine. Uh, and on that time urine, we're usually going to do calcium, creatinine, citrate, urate, and oxalate. And we may do a magnesium. And then the values are expressed as excretion per kilo. So for calcium, it's millimoles per kilo. Um, or for some of them, for citrate and oxalate and urate, it's expressed as uh, millimoles per 1.73 meters squared. And I've um, uh, given Dr. Al Saban a, a PDF of the slides. And at the end, there are tables uh, with the normative uh, values uh, for all of these things that Waleed and I uh, pulled together for a chapter that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and they're a useful reference, but know that that there are reference ranges and sometimes patients will fall outside those ranges and not necessarily be um, abnormal.
urine volume doesn't determine the adequacy of the collection. It's a factor we look at to say that um, is it a risk factor for stone formation, but it's not, uh, you can't look at a urine volume and say this is a good collection. We look to say how much creatinine are you excreting in a day to know whether it's an under collection or an over collection and whether we could trust those values. But most of the time we're dealing with younger kids or kids who are either not continent during the day or not continent for a full 24 hour period. And so we do heavily rely on those spot urines um, that uh, we get when the kids come through a clinic and then we're expressing them as ratios to creatinine and the tables have the, the normative data. And because those ratios change over time, you really have to have a reference range Calcium to creatinine ratios are much higher um, in a newborn and a one-year-old than they are in a teenager. Um, and so you have to have some kind of a reference range to know whether your values are, are normal or not normal. So what I'm gonna do is um, just take you through how a nephrologist thinks about um, stone disease in terms of trying to make a diagnosis. And so genetic testing um, and understanding of renal physiology has really changed how we view a lot of the stone forming disorders. And we know that along the nephron, there are a number of uh, transporters um, that have now been implicated in diseases where you may develop uh, kidney stones or uh, nephrocalcinosis. And there's a fantastic review. It's a little old now, but it's still really great um, by Carla Monaco and John Milner. Um, about the genetic determinants of urolithiasis. And I'm gonna show you how they approach uh, kidney stones, uh, which I found really useful in my career. So if you start with hypercalciuria, as a nephrologist, if we see somebody with hypercalciuria, we're gonna say, is there evidence of something going on in the proximal tubule? Is there evidence of something going on in the loop of Hanlon, which is here? Uh, which is associated with specific disorders? Or is there something going on in the distal tubule? Because hypercalciuria can be associated with defects in multiple places along the nephron. So um, we then look at purine and pyrimidine abnormalities. We look at the hyperoxaluria's and we look at, uh, we look for cystinuria. So I'm gonna give you some really quick uh, vignettes that are gonna illustrate how we use that information um, to diagnose uh, the more rare types of uh, stone formation, uh, stone forming disorders, or those that cause nephrocalcinosis. So, four year old boy found to have proteinuria on a routine dipstick, protein to creatinine ratio was 150. He had an ultrasound done as part of his workup, which showed nephrocalcinosis. Um, his uh, calcium to creatinine ratio, which was done as a result of the nephrocalcinosis, was elevated at 1.9. Um, so, we looked then uh, at the other things that uh, we want to know about if you have protein in the urine and you have nephrocalcinosis and hypercalciuria. And so we had uh, beta 2 microglobulin, which is representative of low molecular weight proteinuria, um, and it was quite elevated. So this puts us into defects of the proximal tubule, where we're looking for low molecular weight proteinuria, but we're also looking at the other things that the uh, proximal tubule should do, and that is looking for generalized amino aciduria, looking for phosphate loss, uh, looking for uh, an increased anion gap uh, acidosis. Um, and so the diseases that are associated with low molecular weight proteinuria um, are dent disease and um, Lowe's oculocerebral uh, syndrome that we're likely to see as nephrologists. A lot of these are going to uh, present to endocrinologists uh, to work up for the uh, hypophosphatemia. And so there is a differential diagnosis for the renal Fanconi syndrome. Um, and that renal Fanconi syndrome includes glycosuria, amino aciduria, phosphaturia, loss of potassium in the urine, uh, bicarbonaturia, and, uh, bicarbonaturia, and often polyuria. And then corresponding in the blood, low potassium, low phosphate, and a normal anion gap acidosis. And it's got a pretty wide uh, differential, but you can see among those stone forming disorders, we're talking about dent disease or, or um, low syndrome. And so this patient went on to have genetics done, which confirmed 
a mutation in the CLCN5 gene, um, which is associated with dent disease, which is uh, an, an X-linked recessive uh, disorder characterized by proximal tubulopathy, low molecular proteinuria with hypercalciuria, uh, about a 50% incidence of stones and 75% incidence of necrocalcinosis and progressive uh, renal insufficiency. Um, and you can see that the CLCN5 carrier is actually in multiple places along the, uh, the tubule. And so the treatment is supportive only at this point. We use thiazides for the hypercalciuria. Um, they may get rickets because of phosphate loss, so we supplement with vitamin D and make sure that the uh, serum phosphates are okay. Uh, and there may be a role for um, citrate uh, to help uh, complex some of the calcium and try and lower the necrocalcinosis risk. So that's one example of how looking for disease in the proximal tubule in somebody with hypercalciuria um, will give you a genetic diagnosis. Um, there's a bit of overlap between uh, dent disease and low syndrome in that um, the, the same mutation can be associated with a different uh, phenotype, but classic lows is a defect in the OCRL1 gene, and these patients develop uh, generalized aminoaciduria, hypercalciuria, um, and uh, have uh, impaired intellectual ability. So second uh, illustrative case is a six-year-old boy referred for nephrocalcinosis, consanguineous parents. And this child was followed by ophthalmology for uh, nystagmus. His initial investigations revealed a calcium to creatinine ratio of 1.6, which is elevated for a six-year-old boy. It should be less than uh, 1.1. Had a slightly low serum magnesium, so we did paired uh, blood and uh, urine magnesium, and his fractional excretion of magnesium was elevated at 6% with a normal that's less than 4%, and this is the formula for calculating the fractional excretion of magnesium. Um, and so when you get uh, magnesium wasting in the urine, then we start to look for defects uh, in the loop of Henry. Um, and that would include the uh, Barter syndrome phenotype, um, which uh, I'm not going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about are the Claudin mutations, which are associated. Uh, the other name for this is called familial hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria nephrocalcinosis, or FHHNC. Um, and these are caused by mutations in the Claudin gene, and it can be either Claudin 16 or Claudin 19. And they are uh, uh, transporters in the loop of Henry. Um, and so this patient had quite dense uh, nephrocalcinosis. Um, he went on to have some genetic testing, which confirmed a Claudin 19 mutation, and that Claudin 19s are associated with ocular disease. Um, and it's important to make this diagnosis uh, because there is a risk of progressive um, nephrocalcinosis and uh, loss of kidney function uh, over time. And the Claudins are uh, previously called paracelin. They are uh, tight junction uh, transporters uh, which control uh, their the charge selective channels. So mutations in the Claudin genes result in loss of magnesium uh, and calcium in the urine and progressive uh, stones and uh, nephrocalcinosis. Uh, and this is that particular patient's ocular findings where you've got these huge uh, egg-like or the teleform lesions in the macula, and it is associated as well, the Claude 19 mutations with progressive visual loss. Next patient is a six-month-old female who presents with a three-month-old history of feeding intolerance, vomiting, failure to thrive, and intermittent febrile neutropenia. Um, that patient had hypokalemia, severe uh, normal anion and gap uh, metabolic acidosis, and a kidney ultrasound that looks like this with unmistakable uh, nephrocalcinosis. Um, and so when we see a normal anion gap acidosis, we look both at the proximal tubule and the distal tubule. Um, and this patient has um, a distal renal tubular acidosis. And there are two genetic defects in the uh, distal tubule in the collecting duct that are associated with uh, distal renal tubular acidosis. 
So hypercalciuria is the backdrop. And then we're looking for disorders that point us to proximal tubule, lupopamily, or a distal tubule to try and make these rare uh, genetic diagnoses. Uh, and so her genetics uh, confirmed uh, distal renal tubular acidosis. Um, and most of these are associated with sensory neural deafness uh, over time, and she has uh, developed that. The treatment of distal RTA is to give sufficient alkali to neutralize the daily acid production, which is about two to three millimoles per kilo per day, and that's usually is potassium citrate. But you need lifelong adherence to prevent progressive nephrocalcinosis and renal damage. Papirine and pyramidine disorders are more um, uh, on, they're, they're more rare overall. Um, we see very few uric acid stones in North America, although they are endemic in some places. Um, and so if we see elevated uh, uric acid in the blood, we're looking for elevated uric acid um, in the urine um, and looking to make sure that we don't have one of these rare disorders like uh, Leshnion or the APRT deficiency. Um, and in the interest of uh, time, I'm just going to um, skip over that. So we've got a little bit of time to talk about the primary um, hydroxyureas. But these are the, uh, in APRT deficiency, the crystals that you see in the urine. Uh, and these are crystals deposited in the kidney tissue uh, that are associated with inflammation and long-term damage to the kidneys. So I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes about the primary hyperoxyureas uh, because there's some new and exciting therapy for, for this otherwise very depressing disorder. So when we see somebody who's got elevated oxalate in the urine, we want to do a good dietary history to make sure that we're not dealing with enteric hyperoxyurea. Um, and uh, if we don't get that uh, diet history of, or if the oxalate is substantially elevated in the urine, we're going to think about um, one of the primary hyperoxyureas. So I'm going to give you re three really quick uh, clinical vignettes to illustrate the kind of spectrum of this disease. So the very first uh, patient that I remember with page three, uh, sorry, page one in my career was a 15 year old boy presented with renal failure creatinine of 1600, um, he had sort of small epigenic kidneys. We actually did a, a kidney biopsy that was reported as showing severe interstitial fibrosis. And these were his kidneys that were quite epigenic uh, looking. So he got um, put on dialysis. He had a living donor transplant. The surgeon commented that the blood vessels were a little bit fragile. He had initial good graft function, and then the graft uh, function just deteriorated. And by Day 20, our biopsy showed calcium oxalate crystals. When we went back to the original biopsy and it was examined under polarized light, there were actually oxalate crystals in the original biopsy. And so this patient went on to be diagnosed with uh, primary hydroxyurea uh, type 1, uh, lost that graft, went back on uh, aggressive dialysis with uh, nocturnal hemo, and then went on to have a combined liver and kidney transplant. Second uh, patient uh, presented at two and a half months of age uh, with a seizure related to hyponatremia with a creatinine of 705 and kidneys that look like this at the bedside. And when you see that, you go, oh no, we have another one. Um, so it's kind of a light bulb diagnosis at the bedside. Um, she had uh, uh, crystals in her retina. We went on to confirm a very elevated plasma oxalate level and a mutation in the AGXT gene. And she got, um, was listed uh, for a liver transplant, uh, went on then to have a kidney transplant, and now has another sibling who's had a preemptive liver transplant still with good kidney function, and another sibling who's on dialysis and who's on new therapy in the hopes of uh, preventing the need for combined liver and kidney transplant. And then finally, the other spectrum of the primary hydroxyurea is just the kid or the young adult who develops kidney stones and who's got a pure calcium oxalate stone and an elevated uh, calcium oxalate in the urine. Um, and some of these mutations, we always do the genetic testing because some of the PH1 mutations are um, uh, partially paradoxin sensitive. So paradoxin is a cofactor for the AGXT gene 
And if you treat with paradoxin, you can substantially lower the oxalate. And that's what happened with this uh, uh, child. Her oxalate went from 1.7 with a normal being less than 0.5 to 0.8. And then with titration, you're actually able to get her oxalate down into the normal range, which then dramatically lowers your risk of, uh, of uh, developing kidney stones. And so the primary hyperoxaluria's are these rare inborn errors of hepatic overproduction of oxalate um, with quite variable presentation, even within the same family. Um, I've seen a baby who presents in renal failure and a teenager who presents with stones with exactly the same genetic mutation. So the three genes that are involved for Th1, the AGXT gene for Th2, um, the, the um, uh, GRHPR gene, and for the HOGA, or the, uh, sorry, PH3 is the HOGA gene. And so I'm just going to briefly show you for PH1, this is the mutation. It uh, metabolizes glyoxalate to glycine. And if you can't metabolize your glyoxalate to glycine, it gets metabolized to oxalate. So presentation at any age, uh, but ultimately, the majority of these patients are going to go on to develop um, uh, impaired kidney function. And up until recently, the only uh, treatment that we had was either to do a liver transplant to replace the deficient enzyme, if you could do that before somebody developed renal failure, or to do a combined liver and kidney transplant. But the outcome from kidney transplant alone um, is really bad. PH2s are less common, whereas the defect is limited to the liver in uh, PH1 and where you can do a liver transplant for cure. In PH2, uh, it's not a liver specific enzyme. Uh, and so the general approach for patients who develop um, renal disease uh, and go on to end stage renal disease is just to do uh, a kidney transplant and then to do medical management uh, with hydration crystal uh, inhibitors. And we'll talk about the siRNA therapy in a sec. And then the kids that um, you guys are uh, quite often going to see in urology clinic are little kids under five years of age who have uh, primary hyperoxaluria type 3, where they develop recurrent and aggressive kidney stone formations at a young age. Um, and then they tend to get better um, over time. And they have a mutation in this gene uh, that's referred to as the HOGA gene. So horrible stone forming uh, diseases. And we know that the more oxalate you have in the urine, the more likely you are to develop um, end stage uh, renal disease over time. So, uh, and as your GFR decreases, your oxalate levels go up um, and uh, you start to deposit oxalate in all your tissues um, and it becomes a very crippling and debilitating disease with arterial uh, disease, necrotic skin lesions, uh, terrible bone uh, diseases. Um, and so they require aggressive uh, dialysis um, and management. And this is a, a picture of a patient with systemic oxalosis with uh, lots of um, uh, calcium deposition. So um, there, there is some really new and exciting uh, therapy on the, uh, on the horizon right now, some of which is actually in clinical practice um, and some which is uh, well along the way towards um, uh, being uh, studied and used in patients. So the therapy is what's called short interfering RNA therapy. And there are two siRNAs currently available for primary hyperoxaluria. The one that um, you will find some literature on and that is marketed by the FDA and they're working on a compassionate program for here in Canada is called uh, uh, Lumicerin or Oxlumo, and it's specific for pH1. It interferes with this enzyme here, the glycolate oxidase. So prevents metabolism of glycolate to glyoxylate, which then can't be metabolized um, to glycine. So shunts into this pathway where it's metabolized to oxalate. So by preventing the overproduction of oxalate, um, it, uh, or gly uh, glyoxalate, um, it prevents the development of oxalate, which is insoluble um, and which damages the kidney. 
Um, and so, uh, as I said, it's been marketed in the States. The company has uh, said that they have a, a commitment to making sure they can bring their product uh, to the people who need it, despite the huge price tag, $55,000 US for a 94.5 milligram uh, vial. And the loading dose uh, is substantial. So if you're less than 10 kilos, it's six milligrams per kilo once monthly for three doses, um, and then a maintenance dose. And the dosing regimen is slightly different for older kids. But the really exciting thing here is that it's a subcutaneous injection. And once you're in the maintenance phase, it's either monthly or every three months. So it's doable, uh, it's expensive, uh, but so far the uh, results look really good. What we don't know is what's gonna happen to patients long-term, whether this is gonna be sustained, whether there's gonna be some unanticipated uh, complications. Um, and for anybody who then has kidney damage and needs to go on to have a kidney transplant, they would need to stay on this therapy for the duration, uh, well, for their whole life, or they're gonna damage their transplant kidney. The, the other um, medication that's currently in clinical uh, trials right now is called netoserin, so also an siRNA. And netoserin is um, being studied for pH one and two. So lumoserin is only for pH one. Netoserin is for pH one and two, and may have an application for pH three as well, because it works through the LDH pathway, specifically in the liver, to prevent metabolism of glyoxylate to oxalate. And this is the final common pathway for pH one, two, and three. Um, and so Vladimir Belotstotsky and Hamilton um, is uh, currently doing uh, one of their uh, studies on uh, pH one and two. Um, and I have uh, one of my patients on compassionate uh, uh, protocol um, in a dialysis baby. And we've seen the plasma oxalate go from 108, which is hugely elevated, down to 45 after just a couple of uh, doses. So this is a real game changer for this disease. There's a lot we don't know and a lot that's going to come out over the next few years. And it's going to change the approach to these patients. They may no longer need um, a liver transplant. Um, and it really behooves us to make this diagnosis so we can offer this therapy and prevent um, uh, the uh, progressive renal damage. So I'm mindful of the fact that you guys need to finish a little bit early. So I think we can stop there at this point. Um, uh, Dr. Alcibant's got the slide deck um, that I'm happy for him to share uh, with you. Uh, it'll go through some of the uh, sort of nonspecific and targeted uh, therapies that we use uh, for things like you know, hypercalceria, what the role of thiazide diuretics versus chelation therapy and so on. Uh, but I think I'll uh, stop there and uh, maybe there's time for a question or two. Thank you very much, Dr. Harvey. Um, yeah, that was a very nice comprehensive talk about um, kidney stones and liver calcinosis. Um, anyone who wants the presentation, please send us an email um, to the same email that you got the invitation through, and we will send you a copy of it. Um, <clears throat> it is very uh, promising um, that we have now another uh, type of treatment for primary hyperoxaluria. Um, and I mean, right now, even if we can just delay the need for transplant, it might be easier to do the surgery anyways when they're a bit older, right? So that's, uh, you know, at least that's, uh, that can work at least that way. Uh, and maybe it will be a long-term thing. Uh, maybe uh, anyone who have a question, please um, write it in the um, questions um, uh, or comments. Um, my question is a bit more clinical <laughs> towards our, um, our part. So. Um, we commonly treat these patients with kidney stones in the operating room, and there is always a question about using NSAIDs, um, like Ketorolac or um, uh, ibuprofen afterwards. Uh, what are your thoughts about using um, NSAIDs in, in these patients? So, you know, as a card-carrying nephrologist, we have an inherent bias against NSAIDs. However, if you have a patient where 
you are pretty sure they don't have a disorder that if, if they have normal kidney function, occasional doses of non-steroidals coupled with good fluid intake are acceptable. Chronic NSAID use is not good for anybody. Um, and NSAID use in anybody who's got impaired renal function is a big no. -no. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So basically, if, if the kidney function is normal, as long as they drink a good amount of fluid. Yeah, uh, so for example, those kids with cystinuria, where they've got recurrent multiple stones, um, they get obstruction, sequelae, they get scarring and damage. Those are the kids where you really want to stay away from your NSAIDs if possible, um, yeah. because they, they have nephrons at risk. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I think there's, uh, let me see if there's any more questions. While you're looking for questions, I really want to highlight um, mm -hmm. that you know, in pediatrics, there is a huge amount of overlap between urology and nephrology. And, um, and that I think it's really important wherever you are to have a good working relationship between your nephrology department and your urology department, because okay. there's so much overlap in this area mm -hmm. that, um, that wherever the point of entry is, we should be trying to do that diagnostic workup and then I refer to urology if it's a big stone and I think it might need removal, or you refer to me um, for the metabolic evaluation. But, but as I said, wherever the kids are coming into the system, we should be doing that initial diagnostic workup. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Thomas, uh, one of the fellows asked a question. Um, so he's saying that if we got a patient with extensive stone burden, um, and he's booked for surgery, uh, we didn't operate on him, so we don't have a sample of the stone. Um, should we refer them to you uh, bef before we operate on them um, since there is some delays with COVID? Or um, should we wait to, uh, to send you the referral after we, um, we get the stone sample? Um, no, so if you've got somebody with extensive stones, you should do that initial workup, get some blood work, make sure the kidney function is normal, check the calcium, the uric acid, those, those uh, mm -hmm. things. Um, send off, at the very least, your spot urine um, to so that we can get an initial look at what's in the urine, recognizing yeah. that in the, in the context of a pre-existing stone that yeah. may alter your urine composition, but it's at least a first look uh, that may allow us uh, to do some uh, further intervention or, or know what diagnostic pathway we have to go down. And then if you can get stones, great, but I kind of see them as going in parallel, not in a linear fashion, right? You don't have to get a stone before I evaluate what the risk factors are. This is true. Okay, I think that's it for today. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Harvey, for uh, giving us this talk and giving us from your time. Uh, and this concludes this academic year for um, the Pediatric Urology Webinar. Uh, to see you next year. Okay, have a good one. All right. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Bye.